Thank you, George, for the very kind introduction. Thank you, Dan, for uh, a really wonderful overview uh, that um, I can simply build on uh, beautifully. Be remiss if I if I didn't uh, give a uh, brief mention that I, I I'm also a faculty member at the Steinhardt School in Public Health, and uh, I apologize that wasn't in my bio. That was, uh, but the folks at Steinhardt would get a little upset if I didn't mention that uh, as part of this. But more importantly, um, let me provide build further on what Dan uh, said regarding children and their unique vulnerability uh, to many factors in the environment, especially chemicals and the, their implications. So pound for pound, children breathe in more air, they eat more food, and they drink more water. So they have a higher exposure than you or I to a given chemical, all things considered. Also, their developing organ systems are especially vulnerable. So um, there are certain pattern steps in development of the lungs, the brain, the various organs in, across the body, especially the, the hormone system, which we'll talk about a little later on. And so when you disrupt that facet of development, uh, you can't rewind the tape and recoup that opportunity. And so fundamentally, if a child's brain is disrupted in its basic wiring, its basic infrastructure, you can have permanent and lifelong consequences, inability to be attentive, to, to remember, to perform well in school, among other things, not to mention the implications for other organ systems. They also have longer years of life. As you saw uh, with the figure uh, of cancer trends increasing over time, children, when they're exposed, have many more years to manifest the effects of uh, an early life environmental exposure. And these were codified in a, a report back in 1993 by the National Academy of Sciences, our nation's most esteemed scientific body um, for, uh, driving home the importance of uh, accounting for children's unique vulnerability to environmental chemicals. So that's all good and well, but why worry about children when it comes to, condi uh, to chronic condition? Well, um, increasingly we've had so-called better living through chemistry. Um, to date, depending on whose numbers you use, we either have about 80,000 chemicals in commerce or more like 143,000 uh, chemicals in, in commerce. The lower estimate comes from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The higher estimate comes from the European Union in a more systematic approach to uh, receiving information from the industry about what chemicals are used in commerce. And roughly one to 3,000 new chemicals are put in uh, to use each year. Um, and while we've seen this dramatic rise in the increase in chemicals, we've also seen a rise in certain chronic conditions emerge. So uh, asthma uh, rates have tripled over the past roughly 30 years. Uh, certain childhood cancers, as uh, Dan really alluded to so beautifully in that figure earlier, have increased uh, brain cancer. Uh, leukemia, you may have noticed. Also, the story of Lance Armstrong is great from the standpoint of treatment of testicular cancer. But unfortunately, with respect to the prevention, there's a bit of a, an unfortunate story in that we've actually seen increases in testicular cancer over time. Um, we've also seen increases, unfortunately, in developmental disabilities, everything from autism to mental retardation to certain learning and behavioral deficits. I'm not embroiling myself here in a debate about whether autism is increased due to diagnosis or due to increasing environmental causation. I think that's for a later conversation and needs more research. But suffice it to say, developmental disabilities in children affect a large amount of kids going to school than a generation ago. And we need to better understand what the origins are of that so we can actually prevent it. And it raises at least a uh, cause for alarm. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't comment about the obesity epidemic. And we'll talk a little bit later about what forces might be behind that obesity epidemic that aren't simply necessarily diet and physical activity. And so suffice it to say that we have a broad array of chronic conditions increasing and chemicals in their use have increased. And, um, how do you put the two together? It's certainly, you can't simply draw two lines and say, oh, there, there's an association, we're all done. Well, there's more to it than that. Um, we know that air pollution contributes not just to the worsening of asthma, but at least with respect to ozone exposure, uh, it may actually contribute to the development of asthma. Lead, methylmercury, pesticides, certain uh, other environmental chemicals 
uh, are known to uh, be toxic to the developing nervous system in kids and contribute to everything from cognitive di uh, disruption to potentially attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, among other health consequences. And unfortunately, not too far from here in the context of the World Trade Center disaster, we saw an increase in the number of kids who were born with small for gestational age, suggesting some uh, permanent disruption, whether it was due to stress or air pollution or both, uh, in the context of that disaster uh, that has permanent and lifelong consequences. Kids who are born small for gestational age have a lesser capacity uh, for learning and development, unfortunately. Um, we also know that these conditions are really costly to society. So we did analysis, as George alluded to, back in 2011 that looked at the conditions for which the evidence is strongest for environmental causation, lead poisoning, childhood cancer, asthma, intellectual disability, prenatal methylmercury toxicity, childhood cancer, among others, and, we, and autism. And we looked at the percentage of those conditions that we could ultimately bring back to environmental risk factors and simply took the amount of, of cases that could ultimately be linked in that way and placed a cost to society in the form of medical care, uh, other social costs, decreased lifetime economic productivity, and the cost of those conditions that could ultimately be tied back to the environment for those conditions for which the causation is strongest was $76.6 billion, that's billion with a B, each year. That, was based, uh, that cost estimate was based on health consequences as they occurred roughly in 2008. There's some good news there. I've mostly talked from the perspective of a horror show in describing those statistics, but there's good news in that we know that prevention works. We know, going back to the, the, his, the legacy of, of even the earliest chemical exposure of concern, uh, childhood lead poisoning, we were able to get lead out of gasoline back in 1976, in part probably because lead was toxic to the catalytic converters that were going into cars at the time. But there was a workaround identified back around early 1980, just as the Carter administration was coming in. And there was an effort by the lead industry and, and the automobile industry to get lead back in, ga in gasoline. And we saw this very funny phenomena where lead levels in kids went dropped dramatically, roughly six micrograms per deciliter. That, those are the units we use to account for, roughly from 16 uh, to 10. And as a, as a kid growing up a couple blocks from here in the West Village, I wish I could have had those micrograms per deciliter reduced earlier than they did. But that was in lockstep with the drop in lead and gasoline used at the time. And the two lines matched up almost perfectly with great correlation. And when that data were presented, those data were being collected by the Centers for Disease Control, people took a deep breath and said, now wait a minute, we actually need to prevent this. There was actually a big economic payout that people would find out a few years later. So Scott Gross and others at the Centers for Disease Control back in 2002 looked at kids born in 2000 and compared their cognitive potential, their IQ, and compared them to kids like me born in the 1970s. I'm already dating myself now as I'm giving this presentation. And they found that kids roughly had 12 micrograms per deciliter lower I, uh, blood lead levels. And they had roughly between two and five IQ points better cognitive potential. As a result, that ge the generation of kids born today is roughly $200 billion more productive than the generation of the 1970s. So I'm a little jealous of the kids I teach in the undergraduate environmental health class that just finished up at Steinhardt uh, this term. Uh, because they're brighter than I am uh, by virtue of having less uh, lead exposure from gasoline. But suffice it to say, prevention works. Um, and it, it's not even just good public health sense, it's actually good economic sense. So, and, and there are other examples. In the in upper Manhattan, there's a study looking at pesticide exposure that actually happened to begin before a ban of pesticides for household use and then saw the ban occur and get implemented just as kids were being born in the cohort over time. And they saw an association with uh, brain development among the kids who were born before the ban, and that association disappeared after the ban, suggesting that there was some cognitive benefit to eliminating uh, this, in this case, was an organophosphorus pesticide called, called, called chlorpyrifos that was, was one of the most toxic pesticides known. Uh, 
uh, that were in use at the time. But it can suggest that uh, you could actually have dramatic impacts on a pop at a population level simply by doing uh, some safe and simple steps. Now, um, ultimately, you're wondering, well, I'm talking a lot about things other than cancer and, sol and solely mentioning cancer. But I am going to close with a bit of a link in an emerging topic, and then I'd be happy to reflect more in, que in comments and questions. One of the emerging categories of concern um, of chemicals are so-called hormone-disrupting chemicals or endocrine-disrupting chemicals. And increasingly, we've identified associations of those endocrine-disrupting chemicals with impacts on the, on the body mass of kids and adolescents on the risk for obesity. Uh, we recently published a study finding an association between a, a child's level in the urine of, of a chemical called bisphenol A, which is banned recently in baby bottles and sippy cups, but remains in aluminum cans in the lining, um, and gets into kids' bodies in that way mainly, because diet's the main route of BPA exposure in kids. And we found an association with their body mass and their risk for obesity, roughly a doubling in, in chance of obesity in all the kids with higher BPA levels compared with kids in the lowest levels of BPA. And so why does that matter? So why does this category of, of chemicals that potentially produce risk for obesity matter? Well, obesity, interesting enough, is a major risk, not just for childhood asthma, uh, cardiovascular risk in later life, but it's actually a pretty prominent risk for certain cancers in later life. And so ultimately, uh, one of the messages that I uh, want to communicate is by preventing these hazardous exposures in early childhood, some of which are linked to obesity, we can actually do a lot potentially to reduce cancer risk in later life. Some of the cancers that are associated with obesity in childhood and in early adulthood are actually some of the later life cancers that Dan talked about in the presentation. Now, I don't have the evidence to say for darn sure that early life exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals is linked to cancer. I'm much more careful than that. I don't have the data to give it to you right here and right now and say that's an association that's valid. But we're already seeing some signals suggesting that some of these chemicals that disrupt hormone and regulation sy systems in our bodies may actually lead to intermediate steps that help accelerate uh, the march on to cancer, of cancers of certain types. We need a lot more research to figure that out. Um, but I'm going to close with one comment. And you're starting to wonder, well, how do we get in this situation in the first place? Why do we have 143,000 chemicals, and why do we have these chemicals going around our bodies without uh, any government involvement in protection? And that's because we have a structure in place for toxic chemicals dating back to 1976, something called the Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, the Nixon administration was actually fairly progressive on environmental issues in its day, but there's been no fix to TSCA since 1976, and we're in 2013. Uh, I was three when TSCA was put into law. And that law it has nothing to do with the fact that I was three back then. But that law essentially takes an innocent until proven guilty approach. First, it grandfathered 60,000 chemicals and assumed, well, we can't regulate you because we're going to assume that there's no harm posed by uh, exposure to these chemicals. But for new chemicals, the EPA roughly has a 60-day period either to give a thumbs up or thumbs down. It doesn't have a lot of strength, often has its hands tied in deciding to intervene and require data about the toxicity of chemicals before they're in manufacture. The European Union, in contrast, has a much more strong, much stronger uh, paradigm in this regulation called REACH. Uh, the acronym I can never spell out, so I won't even try. But suffice it to say that we have a different regulatory threshold for environmental chemicals. And uh, I'm delighted that um, now Senator Lautenberg is hopefully passing the baton in some regulation, in some legislation proposed to Senator Gillibrand that would essentially rewrite TSCA and take a more proactive approach to, to ensure a safety threshold for kids uh, and make sure that chemicals are tested with respect to their potential health effects in kids and in, in, in organ systems that are especially vulnerable. Um, so that's a bit of a broad swath look at how I think about kids and environmental chemicals. And I look forward to your comments when we uh, go sit in the uh, discussion chairs. Thank you very much.